welcome to my podcast on real relationships. My name is Sophie Poisson and I am a relationship expert, international speaker and best-selling author of a book, Your Other Half. I decided to start this podcast because, in my opinion, relationships are currently not being portrayed as what they really are. Whether you're watching the news or on social media, the perception given to people is wrong. And my aim is to talk about about what happens in the real world, talk about real stories, and listen to what real people think to or go through, as opposed to creating expectation of something that doesn't actually exist. I may not agree with everything that is being said by my guests, but it is their chance to express their opinions and their stories. And here today we have Donna Nesif, and we are going to talk about being true to ourselves and the journey that sometimes takes us away from other people's expectations and from things that were probably planned for us, but kind of didn't quite work out that way. Hi, Donna. Hi, good afternoon, Sophie. How are you? I'm okay. You? Yeah, really well. Thank you very much. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? I currently live in the New Forest. I'd say that my life hasn't necessarily been quite what was expected, shall we say. Um, started off quite ordinarily um, as a child, but then then changed a little bit and um, went in a different direction. So in your particular case, it, it mainly happened because of something that happened and started it off when you were younger. Yes, yeah, so I guess you can take it right back that, that far. And I mean, I don't think I'm unusual in many ways, although the particular event that, that you're referring to, which I'll talk about in a second, is pretty unique. Um, a lot of us have things happen in our childhood that, that actually de- define us throughout life if we let it define us. And I think that's, that's what happened to me as well. Um, but I... I from a very early age decided to not let it define us so what actually happened to me is um when i was 11 years old for some unknown reason that still hasn't been sort of um discovered why i started sneezing and i sneezed for a very very long time um and it soon became clear as something that i didn't control um had no control over and couldn't really do much about just for the purpose of uh, people knowing what we're talking about, when you say a very long time, you mean three and a half years? Yes, I do. So not yes. just like a couple of hours or a couple of days? <laughs> no, that's right. And yes, it is uh, in the Guinness Book of World Records. Um, it's something that is quite interesting. Until I wrote the book, um, many people didn't know about. And that's what I meant when I referred to a little earlier about I decided not to let it define me. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a very unpleasant um, experience. That, that sort of age as well, ki- other kids can be quite cruel. Absolutely. I guess, don't get me wrong, I mean, it must have been annoying for you, but for the people around you, it's obviously something that, you know. Absolutely. I mean, it couldn't have been easy for anybody um, at all. And it is quite interesting looking back on, on how it was dealt with as well. I mean, there wasn't anything like coaching, as you and I know these days, as being a positive sort of intervention to support people with challenges available. Um, um, if there had been, maybe that would have helped. Um, but as it was, I very quickly realised that it was something that was unique to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and therefore, it's something that I was going to have to deal with, um, which totally pushed me outside my comfort zone, um, put me in really difficult situations. I love being a part of um, a team and being with people. Um, I'm, I'm quite a um, sort of, um, I enjoy other people's company and I suddenly found myself alone because quite frankly, um, not many people wanted to be with somebody who's constantly sneezing all the time. Plus at school, the teachers, it was a disruption, of course. And um, I had to learn a very different way very quickly. So I guess I was thrown into what might have been, might be described as a survival situation at an early age. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, um, and the positive, I guess, to come out of it, and this is the reason for sharing it in the book, because I had a huge dilemma. Why divulge this? It's something that I've chosen not to be defined by. It's helped define me mm. and make the person I am. Even though I'm cho- choosing not to, to be known for it, it is a part of me. Um, you know, I was bullied quite seriously, if you look About, at it. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Kids are yeah. quite cruel. Yeah. And that is the thing, isn't it? Because bullying often comes when someone is different. Because society, people in general, are brought up 
you know, in such a way that we have certain expectations depending what culture we're in, what country we're in, you know, certain things are kind of, uh, yeah, expected of us. Yeah, I think, I think you're right, Sophie. I think everybody, I believe, wants to be loved and wants to be accepted. Some a lot more so than others. Um, yes, some are independent, some are more self-sufficient. Um, but I, I, in my experience, pretty much everybody um, would rather be liked. Mm. Um, and therefore, if you are different um, or you're not behaving in a certain way, you get treated um, in a different way and quite often outcast. Um, and, you know, bullying is rife. And that is actually what made me say, no, I'm going to tell this part of the story too. Because, mm. yeah, I certainly hope nobody ever has the same experience as me and sneezes for that length of time. Mm. But you know what? An awful lot of pe people experience bullying, both in childhood um, or a bad experience in childhood. Um, and also bullying later on in life and a bad experience. And the point is that however bad it is and seems at the time, we can always learn from it. And there are always positives that we can take away from it. Mm. So obviously this is like from when you were younger and then mm. you, know, you went to university and then you got a very good job in London. Mm -hmm. And then something that in itself, you know, was just a chance encounter, shall you call it, and could have had absolutely no bearing on your life going forward, but actually changed everything, didn't it? Tell us about that. Yes, you're right. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, because I'd had a tough time as a, as a child and had to learn to be resilient, um, I then sort of forged forwards, really, and sort of was a perhaps it made, made me braver and I went out and I, I pushed and I had a need to achieve and I mean it's when I was um, a child there were these expectations as well all very well meaning um, but there was always the pressure that I felt to perform my my parents particularly my mum was very very proud of us um, I guess she was just being a proud parent but the expectations that I felt were enormous and so I always felt I had something to prove. And of course, the incident when I was sneezing didn't really help with that because that kind of just made things harder. Um, so, yeah, I managed to eventually get away to university and push to, to do better um, and ended up in this great corporate job, like you said, um, seemingly ticking all those boxes of expectations, you know, great career, super professional um, um, job, all the rest of it. And then I was living in Brighton at the time and I was coming home really late on the train. Um, and, you know, when you do that as an, as an individual, you kind of avoid most people because quite people, often people are partying or whatever at 10 o'clock at night. Get home, don't you? just want to get home. It had been a hard day. And then all of a sudden, I remember sort of almost dozing off and then feeling this presence and um, looking up and there's a gentleman. And I thought, oh, goodness, what's this? What's happening? Um, and there wasn't, he was middle-aged and he just sort of looked at me and, and he wasn't doing anything and he wasn't a bad looking person at all but he just looked at me really intensely and said what is life all about what is happening and basically poured his heart out to me and said you know I've had enough of this I've got everything I, you know he'd got a wonderful family a lovely house he'd poor she told me you know and he'd been commuting up to London for 30 years and all of a sudden he just had enough of it and he wasn't just you know a bit drunk he was really pouring his heart out to me and I was in my mid twenties and kind of thought, blimey, why is he, Hey, why is he telling me? But it was happening. Um, but also felt a bit of responsibility for this poor guy. Um, so anyway, um, very short conversation. Um, told him it sounded like he was doing great, but he said, no, it's not enough anymore. And that was the end of that conversation. And like you said, it could have just been the end there, but it actually made me stop and think, hold on a minute. <sighs> I really don't want to be like that in 30 years time. Mm. What do I want? What do I really, really want? Um, you know, cause I'd been living my life really for everybody else, you know, trying to meet all these expectations that I'd felt put down as a child, um, you know, to succeed, whatever success was. And I think a lot of people do. We, you know, until you get to an age where maybe you feel that you have a voice and that you shouldn't be worried about, what people say or think of you even um but a lot of the time we do live our lives because of what other people think 
I think we do. And I think, you know, whether it's friends, families, partners, society, they all, there's this kind of the way of doing things. Like we said earlier as well, we all like to be sort of accepted and loved and, or at least liked. Mm. Um, and, and to be part of it, you kind of feel this pressure to conform and be the same and do what people think you should do. But sometimes it's perhaps not what's best for you or what you really want. Mm. I think sometimes is where situations get a little bit out of control and people can sometimes find themselves a bit lost. Um, and I actually believe personally that that this, this um, sort of association or dis misalignment of values is actually what can lead to a lot of um, mental health challenges that we see today, yeah. whether it's anxiety or depression, because people are doing things, but they're not perhaps what they feel they should be doing and I think you know if we if put that actually going off track a little bit but into a relationship sense there's so many people sometimes that don't leave a relationship because they're scared of what everybody else is going to think I mean yeah. I know uh someone who you know she's not been getting on with her partner for for years they've been together 20 odd years um, they, they are not getting on at all, but she won't leave because she doesn't want people to think that she's kicked him out and it's her fault, and he won't leave because he doesn't want people to think it's his fault. And it's just the most stupid, ridiculous reason to stay together. I, I think you're right. I, I think, you know, people... Uh, it's finding the confidence, I think, um, and understanding well, yourself. Your to yourself yeah yeah it is it's I mean I think it all starts with you and you being understanding yourself um because actually if you don't understand yourself how can anybody else understand you yeah, completely. <laughs> and um but that's quite hard isn't it because at the end of the day we seem to also have a culture that I see and hear in a lot of the work that I do as well is that there's always an excuse for something or there's always somebody to blame and actually, to be honest to yourself, you can't blame anybody. Mm. You can't find an excuse because actually it comes down to you. And so that, that can be quite scary territory, I think, for people. Um, and I think going back to how we started the story with what happened to me when I was younger, what that did was make me realise how strong I was as a person mm -hmm. because all of a sudden I was on my own. There was nobody else to, who experienced the same as me. There was nobody else to blame there was nobody really to help um so i didn't really have any option other than to to find my own way through it mm. um and i think this is a thing sometimes you know especially when you feel stuck in a rut or in, in limbo and some description sometimes you're kind of waiting for a magic sign or for someone to come and rescue you but the only person that can get you out of the hall so to speak is yourself i think that yeah i i Totally agree. Of course, that's what happened to me as a child. I, I built resilience at a much earlier age than I perhaps would have done ordinarily. You know, so what, looking back on it, it was quite a horrendous situation for an 11 year old to have to deal with. You know, it had a real positive because it built my resilience to the point that then after that incident we just talked about on the train, when I had time to sit and think, you have quite a lot of time to sit and think when you're commuting from Brighton to London, um, especially when there's no internet in those days, either yeah. or mobile phones, <laughs> um, to actually work out what it was that I wanted. Um, and at that point, I had the confidence because I'd built the resilience so much earlier to actually start stepping outside of my comfort zone again mm -hmm. and moving away from other people's expectations. And in your particular case, it was to go to Africa. It was indeed. So Not just for a holiday, I... to work. To stay <laughs> yeah. there for a while. <laughs> yes, that's right. I mean, I, I came to the conclusion that although I'd got this great corporate career, I'd got money, I'd got X, Y, Z, I'd got all of this sort of... Um, material goods and prestige and respect in my workplace etc cetera, etc cetera, it wasn't enough just like the man on the train it wasn't actually enough for me mm. I wanted to do something that I felt really made a difference um, so yeah I, I didn't just sort of jack everything in I thought well how can I make use my skills to really help people yeah. to really impact um, and make a difference 
And then um, obviously you, you make the decision that you're going to go mm-hmm. and that's all well and good and probably the hardest part to start off with. But then there's a few difficult conversations to be had, isn't there? Because you've got to tell people that that's your yeah. plan and they may not agree with it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I I very quickly realised that this was something that I wanted to do. And if I wanted to make it happen, I needed to to be the one driving it. Because if I told enough people, they would persuade me not to go because it was a crazy idea. And that's really where the title of my book comes in, where they said I was mad because people that I did mention it to, many of them did say, you're mad. And to put it back into perspective, this is obviously over 20 years ago now. Yeah, this is back in 1996. So, you know, it, it's not, or should I say, it is more of a drastic thing to do back then than it would be now, where it would be easier now, probably, than it would have been then. Yeah, I think today things are a lot more visible. Mm. You know, you see a lot more of what's going on. You know, like I mentioned a minute ago, there was no internet. Yeah. These days, you can see what's going on around the world a lot easier. Whereas, yeah, back then, it, w- it, was, it was more difficult. You know, it was, you know, deepest, darkest Africa. That's what my, my childhood was brought up, you know, with stories of. Mm-hmm. Um, and here I was heading off. Who knows where was what most people saw. So, so yeah, I had to really protect myself and get the right influences around me to make sure that I made happen what I wanted to happen. Mm. And in that sort of like year to two years, shall we say, um, wait, from the moment you made the decision. Mm. Um, so for, for, for the benefit of people who are listening but don't know you or can't see you, quite obviously, you are white. Um, mm-hmm. As you said, you're going to the depth of Africa. Mm-hmm. And your boyfriend at the time, before you got married, was not so white. And mm. coming from uh, a small village, that was something that maybe your family struggled with a little bit. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things there, really. I mean, I'd been in a relationship for what, seven, eight years at that point. Um, but this was my decision. And I obviously was in, you know, hopeful that my partner would come with me. Mm-hmm. But um, not necessarily. Um, it was my my choice to do it. Um, so that was quite a quite a big step to take. Um, but he did decide actually that he'd give it a go. Maybe come and you could come as a dependent. Um, and so he came along to the training, um, which was which was good. Um, and then we kind of thought, hold on a minute actually we're changing one set of expectations for another set of expectations because what we were told on the training was actually where we were going to be living in Africa it would be much better if we were married now I didn't have an issue with that because I always hoped I would get married and settle down and have children this dream that lots of people have and you know that was important to me but I knew that he didn't believe in getting married and having kids or anything like that and so to be then told that we needed to get married was actually quite a quite a big shock I yeah, suppose it was pressure shall we say even more yes, it was. than needed <laughs> yes that's right because at the end of the day um this was all now starting to happen quite quickly um and, you know, we, I was supposed to be heading off to Africa in eight weeks. And um, anyway, cut a long story short, um, on the way back from the train, and he did actually turn to me and say, well, maybe we should get married, which, of course, like, for me was actually wonderful because his whole big dream of the, the happily ever after came back into focus. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wonderful, fantastic, how amazing. One, and then it hit. And then it hit that, hold on a minute, actually, this is wonderful for us, but other people's expectations are now all of a sudden sort of coming back into focus as well. Yeah. Um, I came what from a very parents? little village. Yeah, I came from a very little village, um, or small town, um, where expectations were as they were. Everyone pretty much, everyone was pretty much white. They came from the immediate village. I was related to many, many people within the town. Um, so village. It's called a town, but it's the size of a village when I was there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and I quickly realized that actually I was going to at this point have to make some really quite drastic decisions because there was no way I was going to have the big white wedding that um, my family had perhaps hoped, dreamed I might have had um, in eight weeks. 
let alone to somebody who was not um, Christian anyway, who mm-hmm. was actually Muslim. So we had already had the complication of a mixed relationship. Um, we now had the, the stress of eight weeks. Um, and so I very quickly took the decision that I wanted to um, secure the future of this relationship. Um, and we went and got married and we didn't have a big white wedding and we actually just went to the registry office and went married and got married um and that didn't go down particularly well no i bet not <laughs> because going on the tangent a little bit you know um my own parents would like nothing more than for me to get married because that's the norm isn't it mm. but we don't seem to understand that unless you know it's in the right circumstance mm. then I personally believe you shouldn't do it just for the sake of it. Mm. But society kind of believes that you should. Mm. I'm not saying society believes you should get married regardless and, you know, with someone that you're not happy with. But Mm. there is definitely an expectation that everyone should. Maybe not so much now, but I think it's still there. I think there are expectations. And I do think everybody's sort of different, Um, you know, the, the town that I grew up in has changed a bit now, just like a lot of society has changed a bit now. You know, like we're sort of talking about, we're talking about back in 1996, it's quite a while ago. Um, people people are a little bit more open-minded, um, or some people are, but there's still a lot of people who haven't travelled much and still, and haven't had many experiences outside of their own little tiny community. Um, and they have fixed ways of doing things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think sometimes what I, what I was actually doing was not purposely going out to hurt or change anything, but I was doing things a little bit differently um, for good reasons, in my opinion, mm-hmm. but perhaps not in everybody else's opinion. You were doing it for yourself, which a lot of people would say, oh, that's selfish. But mm. then them wanting you to do it a different way that would not suit you is equally as selfish. Hmm. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a different view and a different way. Um, I took the decision that I was doing something for my future with my what I believed was my lifelong partner, the mm-hmm. person that since the day I met, I'd wanted to spend more and more time with and had believed from right from the word go was the one. Mm. It wasn't a simple straight path. It was very rocky and up and down. Um, but I'd always believe that in my heart and so I I wasn't actually worried about a big day about a big event about the pomp and ceremony of a wedding day I was more concerned about the commitment to meant. my partner and the long-term relationship that we were gonna to spend hopefully mm-hmm. the rest of our lives together and, and that caused me to make the decision that I did yeah yeah And obviously, you know, uh, in terms of, um, because what we're talking about is the journey of being true to yourself and getting to make those decisions that, you know, mean that you may not be everyone's cup of tea, but you're doing it for you. And then another one kind of came up a couple of years later when you were pregnant. Yes, that's right. So, yeah, I, that that whole thing of, you know, having a family was always in my mind. Um, and yes, I, we, I was a bit later on, I became pregnant and I suddenly thought, hold on a minute. I have to be clear and I like to have things aligned. Like I said earlier in the conversation, I, I do genuinely believe that a lot of the mental health challenges that a lot of people face, not everything, but a lot of people is because things are out of alignment. People are doing things that they perhaps don't, fully agree with or understand or and they're not sort of sitting well with their own personal values you know some people aren't even really fully aware of what their values are because they they haven't taken the time to reflect and understand themselves to be honest with themselves yeah um so i i was therefore we were looking at you know maybe having children um it was actually before i was pregnant (laughs) when we decided to have children (laughs) um hold on a minute we're going to bring a new world you know life into this world how are we going to do it because we are quite different in some of our upbringings and our beliefs and I thought it was important that we should be united on it so um yeah I did quite a lot of research and thinking and um reflecting and um decided to convert Mm -hmm. convert to Islam which again a lot of people said I was mad 
what was I doing? An educated woman, you know? I thought, and my response was and still is, yes, I am an educated woman who's made a choice, made a decision for me and my family to make sure that we are very clear and together on the future and how we live our lives. And I think this is the thing, isn't it? One of the things I want to talk about is judgment because the issue when we are being true to ourselves Mm. is that we no longer care basically of what other people think. Not that it's a, and I don't mean as, oh, I don't care. It's not like that. It is Mm. just that it doesn't impact us if we disagree. And it is the choice to either support us or not. Yeah. I I think that's, um, that, that is very true. And it's something that even having talked about all of that resilience building, you know, all of that doing things differently, all of that being brave and pushing outside of my comfort zone and all of those things. I still found myself when I was 47 years old in a very dark place. Everything was wonderful. It's all lined up. That whole big dream had all come true and it was super great dream lifestyle job happy family traveling the world living in a lovely place you know everything but it all suddenly went wrong um and I talk about that in the book as well because it's not all wonderful life isn't always wonderful um and what I learned and the positive that came out of that really dark time for me was that after 47 years I'd let go of the expectations particularly my Mm mum and actually like you say I didn't care what people thought now that didn't mean that I that or that doesn't mean that I go out not giving a damn what I do or how I impact people no what that means is actually I'm confident in my own self in my own skin in my own ability um and I'm being true to myself. I've actually, for the first time, because I, I hit rock bottom, I had to rebuild myself, you mm-hmm. know, a bit like a house, you know, had to rebuild it from scratch um, in many ways. Um, and I built it stronger without the need for endorsement from other people. And I think, you know, it is a very, very, I'm not going to say difficult. It's the only word I can kind of like think off right now. What I'm trying to say is that, to genuinely be at that point mm. takes a lot of work. And to genuinely, you know, feel comfortable without worrying maybe about what other people think. Mm. Um, but I, I also believe that, you know, we talk about mental health a lot at the moment. Um, it seems to be the new thing. I'm probably being a bit harsh, but you know, I, I, I sometimes come across a lot of people who self-diagnose anxiety, for instance. Mm. And if I'm honest, they're not anxious at all. It's not anxiety they're suffering from. They, it, it's not being true to themselves. And they're trying to be something to their partner and to their kids, to their parents, to their neighbours, to their work colleagues, and they end up losing themselves in the process. Mm. And this mm. anxiety comes from the fear of being found out, I suppose. No, there's nothing to find out, but mm. it's that kind of like not knowing who you are. Yeah, I, I think it's critical to be honest to yourself. Um, and I, I believe that, the, you know, happiness, fulfillment comes from being honest. Um, I was discussing this the other day, actually, with, um, with a client. Um, if we start to tell stories, we soon lose control of them because you start building a web you know and where are you within that web and then all of a sudden you become anxious you know not anxiety as in a clinical diagnosis Mm -hmm. but you become anxious who is it you've told what and what you know um perceived sort of image are you supposed to be portraying here and there and everywhere else and trying to keep a, a tab of it all suddenly becomes a huge effort whereas actually if you can you've just got the confidence to be you then you are you and mm. you know what? Not everybody loves us. You know? No, no. But actually, we don't need everybody to love us. We just need a few good people to love us. That's and right. Life is fine. <laughs> but I think, again, you know, one of the uh, reasons for this anxiety, so to speak, that is not real anxiety, is that 
what we're fed all the time and consciously is how everybody else is loved by everyone. How they've got millions of followers on Facebook, Instagram, whatever, how their life appears to be so wonderful. And actually we do regularly forget that we really genuinely don't know what goes on behind closed doors. And I know that's a cliche, but it is so true. I, I think it is. And I think more so than ever these days, there's a huge amount of pressure on people to look a certain way, behave a certain way, do certain things, buy certain items. Um, you know, it's a very, very big push on materialism. You're only successful if you've got this or you do that or you look this way. You know, success is something really personal. Yeah. It's success is whatever it is to you. And all of these things don't do anything for the soul. No, and I think going back, you know, to that uh, person I mentioned earlier, um, who, you know, won't leave a partner of 20 years because she wants him to do it and he won't leave her because he wants her to do it. Mm. You know, you regularly see pictures on Facebook of them, like, supposedly having a date night. Mm. So if you don't know the true story, you know, they give off that vibe, that perception that everything's good. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a there's a there's a good there's a lot to learn from technology, and social media does have a part to play, and it is here to stay in our lives. Um, but I very much believe in being real, and that's why everything pretty much that I do is outdoors. It's in touch with nature. You know, my networking that I do, I run the networking, so it's getting outside, walking amongst trees. My coaching that I do is outside, walking and talking, um, you know, retreats, giving people time and space and helping them reconnect with what is real. Because we people, there are a lot of people that live in an imaginary world, mm. an imaginary world with their phone, and that is their life. And everybody else seems to be having such a much better time than them. Whereas actually, are they? Like your part, those people that you're talking about, are they? You know, you know, you know a different side. There's probably other people who know other sides. And actually, mm. what we need to, I believe, find is the confidence in ourselves to do what we want, and also to connect with all of those things that are actually free. It's free to go for a walk in the park, or in the forest, or by the sea, or just into the garden, or wherever. It's free to smile to people with people. You know, there's all sorts of little kind touches that we can do that don't actually cost us anything, mm -hmm. but make us feel so much better. You know, nature is there to help us. People are there to support us. And it's making sure that we portray ourselves in the right way to make sure that the influences that surround us are positive mm. and help us achieve whatever it is we want to achieve and keep us well. Yeah, and I think, you know, we, 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 we've touched quite a few times on the importance of knowing ourselves. Mm. I think there's more to it than that. It's not just knowing ourselves, it's accepting ourselves for who we are. You know, what's and all, so to speak, because we've all got bad points. We know that, you know, it's light and dark. You know, light doesn't exist without darkness. Mm. You know, I'll put a quote up today, funny enough, which was um, that, the stars can't shine without darkness. Absolutely. And we need to accept that, you know, we have bad points too, but what are they? And how can we turn them into positives? I mean, in my particular case, I know I'm extremely stubborn, but that can be bad at times when I just nag a little bit too much maybe. But it also makes me very resilient because I won't give up. Yeah, yeah. and you're very focused. You'll make sure it happens. Mm. And that's, And I think that's what, a lot of people would do well to to sort of reframe things sometimes you know you've got old sayings the glass is half full not half empty and I think sometimes people are hankering off after what they don't have you know so it says life is better they've got a bigger car a faster you know lifestyle whatever actually just take a moment to reflect on what we have got you know because to be truthful you know I've been fortunate enough to to live in less developed countries to travel to very poor countries to see true suffering um, and you know what here today in the UK we have got an awful lot to be thankful about we can all moan 
any fool can moan about things, but actually we've got a lot to be thankful. And I think if we looked at ourselves and started there, you know, we're alive, we're in a safe country, you know, um, we've got our health. If, you know, we've, we've got things here that many people around the world don't have. Don't have. <laughs> the glass analogy right mm. i saw something some time ago which i really liked which was that actually the glass is not half full it's not half empty it just needs filling up again <laughs> like that. yeah i like that too that's right that's it and and, and that's it we, we we have to work at things you know things don't come easily if somebody has got a wonderful life a truly wonderful life then they don't take it for granted they, they keep working at it. And do you think, uh, because sometimes people say, you know, that when you hit your 40s, 50s, you may be more subject, shall we say, for one of better words, to a midlife crisis hmm. um, where you probably become more true to yourself. But hmm. actually, is it not that it's just age and you've had enough and you are now more assertive about your own needs? Yes, I mean... I think age helps, you know, experience helps um, without a shadow of a doubt. It helps to build confidence if you view that glass as half full and if you realise that you do have to keep topping it up from time to time. Mm -hmm. You know, I think when you're younger, you might expect to always get a full glass, you know, whereas actually you realise as you get older, you've got, it's your responsibility to do something about it. Um, I think a lot of people do sort of take time to step back for, for a variety of reasons when they reach middle life. Maybe they've paid off their mortgage and they don't have to worry so much about focusing on work. Maybe they've had kids and they've left home um, and they've got more time to sort of reflect on themselves again. Um, but I do think it's good if we can actually inspire others at a younger age to to have the confidence to um, you know, be true to themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and that in the work that I do is something that I really, really cherish. Um, you know, I recently had um, somebody I was working with who's like 20 years old, so actually, I don't care anymore about what people think of me. And I said, oh, tell me about that, you know. Um, and what he meant was that actually he didn't care what his parents thought or his friends thought he wasn't going to wear this out if it wasn't comfortable or what, what it wasn't what he wanted to wear out or you know he, he suddenly had sort of matured to the point of having the confidence to say hey this is me you know I, I'm accepting that not everyone's going to love me but this is me and I thought wow I wish I'd had that confidence at 20. <laughs> uh, there's, there's also an element I think um the, the... I watched the shift uh, from uh, Dr. Wen Dyer a few years ago, which was ran, ran about the time that, you know, I had uh, a nervous breakdown. Mm. And one of the things in that film that he, he says is how he refers to, you know, the different times of life as uh, morning, afternoon and evening. Mm. And how in the morning we think we know it all and we think we know what's important. And when we get into the afternoon, we realize that actually these things that we were fighting for to get are not that important at all. And how in the evening we realize that what we believed in the morning was a lie. And I think the analogy is probably made towards, you know, how we want status, we want money, we want this, that and the other. And yeah, I'm not saying, you know, people don't want money. We need it. Everybody needs it wherever you are in the world but you know it's more about what really matters as you said you know the kind touches the people that are around us whether we, we're leaving a positive impact mm. in the world a, a sense of purpose you know yeah I, I think I think you're right um and I do think the key to all of this is actually working with with young younger people as well um to actually inspire them mm. to give them the confidence because they are the change makers really yeah. because like like you've said in your analogy there when you get into later life of course we've got the ability to to make a difference and make a change in our own little world um but actually it's the younger people that will hopefully go out and uh, make the 
biggest impacts and make the positive differences. Um, and I also think that that helps society as well. Um, you know, particularly with one going back to what we're talking about, the social media and the technology side of things to help people be more real and to reconnect with what's important to them. Like you say, the people with nature, mm. with, you know, the things that are important to us, keep us well. Yeah. Well, Donna, we're nearly getting towards the end of our time mm. together. But uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you finally is, what would you say to someone who maybe is a little bit scared of change and that is what is stopping them from maybe being true to themselves? I'd say to them, be brave, believe in yourself. So how do you know that the best opportunity of your life is not just waiting for you if you can just take that step towards that change? Mm. Yeah, and I think sometimes uh, you, you mentioned, you know, opportunity. I think sometimes we don't recognise the opportunities necessarily. Another analogy is, you know, if you're looking for a cake, to make it quite simple, mm. if you're looking for a cake, but all you see is a bag of flour, some eggs and some sugar, you're mm. not necessarily going to make the connection. But actually, if you do a tiny little bit of effort, yeah. you will have a cake. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're right. Is people tend to think of change because of those expectations and the people around them quite often as negative. Change provides the best opportunities that you can imagine, but you have to have your eyes and ears open mm. to see them and you have to have built your resilience and your confidence to be able to take them. Mm. Um, and that's why, you know, in life, rubbish things happen from time to time and we can neither get, you know, overwhelmed by them and sucked into them or we can kind of say, okay, what have I learned from that and move forward? Because actually that's the resilience building. That yeah, and I mean, you know, it, take the opportunities. Completely. It's completely, it's a wheel, isn't it? It mm. goes down, it goes back up, it goes down, it goes back up. Mm. Physics. It's not going to be perfect all the time. There's good times, there's bad times. As I was no. sort of saying earlier, light and dark, you know. Yep. That's right. That's right. But, yep. Donna, thank you so much. That That's is all right. what we've got time for today. And for everybody else, if you enjoyed the show, then please subscribe, leave us a review, but more importantly, come back for the next episode. Thank you. Bye.